Welcome to the API Connections podcast. This conversation with data scientist Ku Ping Sheng is broken into two parts. In part one, we discuss the complexities of AI governance and the need for expertise across several disciplines to make it effective. We discuss bias in AI and the importance of transparency and a review mechanism to address that bias. And we discuss how it's up to all of us to gain AI literacy so that we can ensure that AI works for us rather than against us. So enjoy part one. We've all been talking about the opportunities, but also the dangers of AI. For some people, the answer is better governance. Governance itself is a loaded term. It means different things to different people, and it's not actually easy to, to implement. So I'm very pleased to welcome Ku Ping Sheng, uh, the Practicum Director at Data Science Rex, to share uh, his perspective on how we can build trustable AI. So welcome, Ku. Hey, John. Nice meeting you, and uh, thanks for the opportunity for me to share to your community on uh, trustable AI. Uh, really pleased to, to have you. And uh, you've been in the data science game for, for quite some time. So mm -hmm. you've seen some of the changes from uh, the early use of, of analytics, predictive analytics, diagnostic, and and through the current excitement about large language models. The concerns about things like bias and disinformation have been around even before large language models. And so there have already been some moves to to address this at both mm -hmm. government and corporate levels. Could you give mm -hmm. sort of a, a picture of, of how how you've seen the attempts at AI governance uh, being shaped? So maybe let me, let me just quickly share like how the whole industry has evolved since I started working in, in this role. Um, so what happened is I started my career in 2003. So that was during the SARS period. So unfortunately, whatever that's happening right now is a, is a stark reminder of what happened uh, when I started my career. So back then, uh, everything was about data. The term that is usually associated with data is this term called business intelligence, about visualization, reporting, trying to understand what's happening inside the organizations. And the biggest user, of course, for business intelligence will be finance, the banking, and all this. Um, subsequently, it went to this thing called data analytics. And now, given that there's a lot more data, machine learning is now being used uh, for the analysis work. Data analytics exists for quite a fair bit, but it was quickly overtaken by another term called data science. And before you know it, right, data science, although the term data scientist is still around, most people's or, or most people mind right now is actually artificial intelligence, <laughs> which was uh, I think brought about in uh, 2016. If I if I'm if my memory didn't fail me, uh, why 2016 was because of uh, AlphaGo. AlphaGo was a software that was created by uh, DeepMind slash uh, Google. And uh, it was playing the Go Chess, which is uh, considered the sort of the pinnacle of intelligence. And it would be, it's predicted that a human, uh, the, a machine won't be able to be a human so soon. And the timeline was actually 2035. That was what most researchers were saying that maybe by 2035, we can have a machine that can beat a human player in, in Go Chess. And of course it happened in 2016. Um, so it was like 20 years earlier than predicted. And of course that's where things starts getting more, I would say more interesting and more fun. You start seeing AI in our smartphones, you start seeing AI in spam detection, in our emails and stuff like that. Uh, and no thanks to Hollywood movies and other movies that you probably have seen, right? Then this is where uh, people start to think, let their imagination run wild and say that you have to be very careful. AI can cause existential risk, uh, and, and so on and so forth. And this is where now in this particular year, especially not with, G with ChatGPT, right, bring, bring sort of AI into a lot of people's mind. Uh, people start to talk about governance. We should, we should govern our usage of AI. I think that's, that's a landscape right now, uh, looking at it from the past. Uh, 20 years. And so everyone, everyone's, every country, in fact, not only everyone alone, but every country now also has been thinking about, hey, we need to think about governance. How do we ensure that we are using uh, effectively, efficiently, and for the good of humanity and, and so on and so forth. 
Yeah. So there have been a, a number of problems highlighted. Um, even before you look at AI, simply mm. any algorithm, mm. um, whether it's machine learning, uh, language models, or anything, uh, mm -hmm. has um, an inherent bias because it's the bias of the creator or the data that uh, it's mm. using uh, mm. to, to process. And mm. so when we look at um, the, the problems that that introduces, whether it may be because uh, through racial discrimination, because most of the data is, or, or gender discrimination, because most of the data is based on uh, white men in Western countries and doesn't necessarily apply to the rest of the, the world. And, and that has implications for whether people can get loans or the source of medical treatment that they should. Uh, be. So there, there's a whole range of problems with um, bias in mm. the data, uh, mm. data sets themselves, and mm. then the algorithms that process them. And then the, um, the challenges of um, bad actors introducing um, uh, data of their, of their own in order to spread uh, dis disinformation. So mm. there have been a number of initiatives initiatives and poor government has one uh, that they presented at the world economic forum there are other countries have also introduced uh things within within companies who are planning to use things there is also a need for uh for governance to ensure that uh we're making good decisions that uh, we're not disadvantaging uh, individuals. So we want to do good business overall, but we also want to protect uh, individual uh, customers or, or stakeholders uh, from uh, from the, the effects of a bad decision that, mm. that we may make. But uh, the, the traditional way of doing governance in uh, organizations, particularly large ones, is through committees that review things, that uh, set standards and, and policies, and then look to see how they can enforce those. What What's your view on um, how, how that's going to cope with this um, increased use of, of algorithms mm -hmm. to, uh, to make, uh, not only present data to humans, but to make decisions often uh, on their behalf? Okay, uh, so a few things I like to address here. Like, I think some of the things we pointed out, like for instance, biasness, and uh, maybe we should even answer the question, what is governance in the first place? Um, so at least my definition of governance would be uh, to proliferate uh, best practices and also to prevent uh, abuse of uh, AI uh, being used, of course, in, in, uh, in unfavorable situations. Uh, maybe for instance, for instance, like using it for weapons, uh, for killing, for disadvantaging certain groups, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So, um, that would be how I term governance. But I wanted to address a bit more on the bias, uh, on this thing about bias. I'm of the opinion that bias cannot be totally removed. There's no way you can surgically remove it so precise that Totally, a data set doesn't have any bias. Why I'm saying that is because the, the data that we use come from humans. And at the end of the day, we humans, let's not say we humans are biased, but we humans have our own preferences. And our preferences are built based upon uh, what we have read, the kind of environment that we brought up, uh, and also some of the maybe innate taste and flavor that you might actually have as well. So a common example I always give to other people uh, is when you go to a gelato shop. If you go to a gelato shop, right, you will you will definitely zoom into a, a few flavors before you even before you even uh how you you won't go in and say oh all all of it is your favorite flavors because if all of them are your favorite flavor flavors, you don't have a fla favorite at all. So once you go in, there are certain flavors that you would like to have on that particular day. It could be maybe pistachio, it could be beans, it could be Belgium chocolate, or it could be dark chocolate, and, and so on and so forth. So with that in mind, right, naturally we humans will have preferences, and preferences becomes negative. When preferences becomes negative, it becomes biased, because it hurts someone. 
portray it, uh, it portrays someone maybe not not as it is. You negatively portray someone. So that, that, that becomes a bias itself. And we humans, like I said, we, as long as we humans have preferences, there's a very good chance that we will be biased. So in that case, and we humans are the ones who's producing the data that will be used to train the machines. So we can't run away from the fact that data will be biased. The only thing what, what we can do as maybe model trainers or, or as people who use AI or whatever is to be aware of it and try to reduce it to the minimum as much as possible. Of course, certain situations will require certain technical skills to be, to be able to do that. But I think that's not the focus for this uh, video or podcast. Uh, but I just want to, like I said, just to share uh, in terms of bias, there's no way we can totally remove it. We can only just reduce it to the to the bare minimum as much as possible. Now, having coming coming to the governance side, right? I think for governance to be able to prevent any abuse uh, and, and so on and so forth, and looking at it from two perspectives, uh, one is from a business organization perspective, and another one is coming in from uh, maybe a country perspective or a national level perspective, right? Personally, I feel that you definitely will need someone technical, someone who's familiar with AI and algorithms and the training of the models in the committee, in the committee, that's for sure. If you're going to use it at sort of at the national level, at if you're going to use AI at the national level, then it, quite, it requires a lot more other things as well. Because like, for instance, if you want to prevent, if you want to prevent abuse, this is where you have to enact policies, you have to enact rules, you have to enact laws perhaps maybe even maybe just guidelines if you don't want to be to be too strict so this is why this is why you need other people as well so what other kind of backgrounds you probably will need right i will kind of feel you probably need someone who uh is familiar with the with uh, technology law or risk management uh risk risk management law uh and also a bit on this. why do we even have the law and how uh how how does, how does setting up this law guidelines or everything else to impact society? So that's one. I probably also will say that you need someone with some economics background because you're using AI as a tool for innovation. Then you also have to see like, for instance, how, what can we do to do, uh, increase innovation, increase uh, or accelerate the in innovation cycle uh, from an economics perspective, but also try to reduce the risk of, risk of it in the first place. So that's one uh, economics. Uh, of course, you need some people with policy making background because policy making background you need uh, to look at many many different areas when you do a policy. Because once you implement a policy, you definitely will impact many many different areas. It could be manpower, it could be education, it could be healthcare, it could be environment, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So you need someone very good or very familiar with policy making, how to go about uh, ensuring that the uh, governance framework that's being set up right can encourage innovation but at the same time manage risk of using uh, AI so policy making but of course all this framework or whatever that you mentioned if you don't have auditors if you don't have regulators coming into the picture to say hey whether is, is this easy to regulate is it easy to make the audit uh, how do we ensure that certain levels is met and so on and so forth right so that's why I also feel that uh, you need someone with some audit background or regulation regulation background uh, to, to join the committee as well, to be able to, uh, again, like I said, be able to enforce the framework that's being set up by the committee altogether. So these are just initial thoughts and areas where I feel that uh, AI governance committee should, should have. Lah. So if you... That's not what I mentioned could be at the national level, but if you bring it down to the uh, organization level, business organization level, right, then that's, I will feel you probably will need someone from the marketing slash PR uh, folks as well, so that they know how to go about if anything happens, uh, if anything happens, some issues because of uh, using AI or whatever, this is where the PR and marketing folks can come in the picture uh, altogether. So, some so you, you mentioned lots of different people with lots of different skills. And um, I, I, I guess pick up on the first point that you made is that sure. recognizing that we all have some bias. Recognizing it, uh, it requires not just recognizing, but you also want to be able to quantify what that, that, that bias mm -hmm. uh, is. 
and mm. also have some transparency about it. So mm. one of the challenges of, of bias is that when we don't recognize it, um, we don't have a develop a, a mechanism for addressing some of the downsides of that of that mm. bias. If we're mm. going to disadvantage a certain group, then there should be a mechanism for somebody to say, well, it's not working in my case. The algorithm might work 99% of the time, but in in my case, it's uh, making the wrong decision. It's disadvantaging me. And so mm. that having that review mechanism, but you can't have a review mechanism if you don't have the transparency of it. And if you don't know how that algorithm has made that decision, and particularly mm. with the different skill sets that you, you talked about, uh, bring to the, you don't find that all those skills in one person. You have to have people from different perspectives mm. to bring mm. together the the legal, the policy, the regulatory, the, the um, audit, the marketing, all those sorts of, of skills. So it has to be explainable. Einstein said something like, if you can't explain it to a five-year-old, then you don't really understand it. But this is one huge challenge of, of AI is that often even the data scientists uh, who have created this model don't know exactly what the model is going to recommend in a given case mm. because the, the neural network may follow a different path or and come up with a, a slightly different uh, recommendation, uh, may, may generate a different uh, output. So what do you see as being important for all of these different people to understand, uh, given that they're not going to become data scientists themselves, what what would you recommend for um, specialists non who are not data scientists mm -hmm. to understand about uh, the the AI and what they should contribute to uh, to those that the sort of governance discussion? I think from from. So I think we are coming from the consumer perspective, uh, whether they I get abused or, or not, and whether is it, uh, I'll put it as whether is it a reasonable <laughs> abuse uh, in the mm. first place. Um, so this is where I think literacy comes in the picture. Uh, and I do feel that going forward, every one of us, every one of us, uh, we will have to be literate in data. We also will have to be literate in AI. Now, here's a, here, here's a thing. Uh. Literacy doesn't mean that you become a professional. Literacy means you understand how it works. You don't have to... So it, it's how to put it. You know how the car, you, you know how to drive the car, but you don't need to know how the car actually works. Put it. So, so, so that's, that's what I meant by uh, literacy. And I think going forward, again, like I said, everyone, everyone would need to have some level of literacy with, with regards to data and with regards to uh, AI. Now, why is that the case? Let's just look at AI literacy alone. So now once you, once you are literate with AI, you understand how, how, how AI works. So first thing first is you will have a very good idea how to protect yourself first, how to protect yourself from being abused. That's one. Second thing is also, you will also have some idea whether you've been abused because you roughly have some idea, if certain expectation, you have certain expectation that I, I shouldn't be getting this. Then they have a very good idea, and when they raise a certain point, when they raise a certain point, if it's valid, people will listen. If you if it's not valid, right, and you, and people will just say that hey, you're just creating nonsense. It's something that we can't act upon. But if you're literate, you know what's possible and what's not possible. Mm -hmm. The way you convince, the way you get someone to hear from you, right, is a lot more credible. Huh? Interesting, yeah. you brought out the the analogy of of driving a car. Because mm -hmm. I often use that analogy when I'm describing the benefits of using APIs. Because pretty much uh, a lot of people know how to drive a car, but very few people know if you lifted the bonnet, mm -hmm. people might be able to identify that that's the engine there yeah. <laughs> and that's the battery. Uh, yeah. And here's where I check the oil, but they don't know anything else. Mm -hmm. uh, but the thing is they don't need to know because the complexity of the car is taken away from them, yeah. uh, is hidden from them, uh, it's under that bonnet, and they interact with the car through its interfaces. Mm. You have a handle to it so you can open the door. You, mm. um, you sit behind the, the, the wheel 
the steering wheel is how you um, tell the car which direction you want to go. Yep. You, the pedals on the floor uh, yep. <laughs> describe how, how fast you want the car to go or when you want it to stop. So yep. these interfaces are what helps you interact with something that's so complex that you don't understand it. Yep. But with AI, what are the interfaces that we can really uh, use when you talk about what do we expect from, from the inputs that we provide and the outputs that we get from it? How, how are we um, going to see measure getting the right result for me? Uh, mm -hmm. Am I not being abused by the by the algorithm? Uh, not being disadvantaged? Is it the right result for me? And if I need to raise uh, 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 the the flag and say uh, this isn't this isn't right, mm -hmm. what are the th sorts of things that I uh, should be thinking about uh, explaining to to people? Because if I if I call it up a contact center of a major mm -hmm. company and I say your algorithm doesn't work or it hasn't done the right thing by me, um, I don't think I'm going to get a very um, uh, helpful uh, answer because the contact center agent isn't going to say, well, uh, I'd probably just say, I don't understand the algorithm either, but why is the algorithm uh, the problem? I mean, Maybe it's you. I think the consumer should go in and say that it's the algorithm that has a problem because that itself mm. is a bias really. Because you are mm. you're already saying that the algorithm is the problem, which may not be the case uh, until we really Mm -hmm. do an investigation. However, you do touch on a, a quite a good point in the sense that, hey, how do we as consumers, right, uh, raise it, raise it uh, so that there's a double check. Not necessarily that it's a problem, but that at least there's a as an opportunity to raise it up and, and double check, make sure that uh, you're not subjected to abuse or the biases or biases came from uh, somewhere else. Uh, I think this is where companies companies who wants to still earn the consumer dollars will have to work on it, especially let's say if they want to still continue to tap on to AI. Because uh, again, going back, uh, like I said, um, as long as you're going to use AI, there will be biases. There will be biases. That's one. Second thing is also uh, if, the, if the trend right now continues where most people use machine learning or AI to build, uh, use machine learning to build uh, AI tools. So any company will then have to deal with false positive and false negative as long as you're using machine learning, uh, especially supervised learning. Which in that case, you have to have sort of like a, a feedback process or mechanism built. So what I mean by that would be like, so maybe uh, the company who wants to continue use, using AI, especially for uh, consumer businesses and so on and so forth, they should have a dedicated channel for people to raise uh, issues, uh, to raise uh, maybe a second look on the decision. But we also, if you, but if you put yourself in the shoe of the business, right, that's also the other thing about how do we prevent abuse. I mean, if if we don't do that kind of prevention of abuse, right, what's going to happen is anytime someone come across a unfavorable decision, he or she is just going to raise it regardless. So like definitely will appeal for it. So how do we go ahead and reduce that, that abuse also as well? I think that's also another mm -hmm. challenge uh, to think about, I'll, I'll, I'll say. But I think yeah, I'll and, and, like, and, hmm. and, and, and in the, uh, in, in the legal system uh, uh, and corollaries of, of that, because mm. there needs to be a, a mechanism for somebody to appeal a, a decision that uh, has gone against them. Um, hmm. if they feel that the, they haven't had a, a, a fair trial. But then yeah. there also needs to be a, a mechanism on, on the other side uh, to prevent, uh, I think it's called vexatious litigation, where somebody's hanging <laughs> away saying you, you did the wrong thing um, when, when actually they, they are, they are at, at fault and, hmm. uh, and trying to get um, a better result um, simply by... Um, perseverance. But mm. there have been cases where uh, algorithms or decisions about technology have uh, disadvantaged some some people, even without mm. the machine learning aspect of it. 
Uh, yeah. in, in Australia, people are aware of the, the roto, robo debt um, problem where um, some algorithm uh, decided that people had been given um, uh, government benefits that they didn't deserve and they needed mm. to pay it back. And these mm. people didn't really feel that they had uh, a mechanism for disputing that, that decision. And so there is that feedback mechanism uh, in order to ensure that people don't get disadvantaged, there needs to be some way for them to, to raise that and, and be and be heard. But as mm. you said, there are always people who are trying to um, game any any system. So it needs to be um, companies also need to recognize, need to have a good filtering mechanism for that feedback um, because the feedback, um, making good decisions about that feedback also has its own uh, type one and type two errors or false positive, false negative uh, uh, errors uh, in mm. it. So um, I, I guess the, the challenge though is where where does it stop and at what point do you say, I need to escalate over the top of this whole process because this is not, um, uh, this is not being resolved. I hope you enjoyed part one of my conversation with Ku. In part two, we explore the challenges organizations face with data practices and the impact this has on API governance. We talk about the need for documentation and knowledge management within the organization and the role of AI itself in enhancing documentation efforts and the need for continuous improvement.